very much. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and speakers. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to chair this opening plenary session of Horasis Major 2023. I was born in 1945, and the world was empty and quiet. Today, it is not empty, and it's certainly not quiet. And over the past 78, 80 years, extraordinary events have taken place. And our civilization is still intact, but only just. There are real problems on the horizon, but as we speak today, we must be conscious of the charade that's happening in Dubai under the banner of COP28, where nothing positive and enduring is likely to emerge. We must also be very cognizant of the wars and conflicts that are going on around the world. In particular, the fact that Ukrainians are squabbling with Russians, simply because the expansion of NATO in 2014 became such a problem for President Putin. And of course, the most recent thing to haunt humanity is the slaughter that's happening in the Middle East at the moment in Israel and Palestine. And here we are in Vietnam, one of the most thriving economies in Southeast Asia. And an economy that contains real hope along with other Southeast Asian economies, and in fact, ASEAN as a whole. What was interesting in my life, and why I mentioned I was born in Vietnam, was gradually it became very obvious that any moral authority the West had before 1945 has gradually slipped away and has headed east. Which means that today, those of us sitting here are reminded of a quote by Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a thoughtful, small group of committed citizens change the world, because nothing else ever has. And so our challenge is to grasp the metal, to really face facts and to face the fact that all is not well in our world, all is not well in our civilization, but there are certain factors, very positive factors, including the ingenuity of humanity and the sheer determination to survive that hopefully will get us through and break through into a new kind of essence, if you like, of what it means to be human. Because that is the real question ahead of us today. What does it mean today and in the future to be human? I have behind me very eminent panel, and I'm not going to introduce them, because if you don't know them, Google them, look them up. We don't want to waste time with who we are, we want to get straight into our ideas. I want to leave you in your minds with, with two constituencies that are important, that we hardly ever address. The first constituency is young people. Young people around the world, and particularly the young people and their voices in the global south, who have yet to be heard. And in that constituency of youth, it's the women that still need to stand up and be heard, because we live in a world designed by men, for men. Male is the default mode. And so it's time for women and young women to stand up and step to a role of leadership. And the other constituency that we seem to ignore, happy to deal with their proxies all the time, are the owners of capital. We 
cannot avoid engaging the owners of capital. And a lot of that capital is tied up, as you will hear today, in family businesses, in small businesses. And that is the engine, the economic engine of Southeast Asia. We can't avoid either thinking about the influence of China and the cosmological origins of the signing worldview, which are so threatening to the US empire at the moment. We'll try and cover all of that from different perspectives in terms of the economy, education, technology, and probably a whole variety of other things as well. So welcome, I'm going to pass immediately, Henry, to you to give us an opening session on China. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Richard, for the, for the great open and uh, good afternoon to all the, all the dear panelists and also our dear participants of the conference. Uh, thank uh, Oasis uh, for, for inviting me to be here. I think the topic today is, is really fascinating. We talk about uh, this, uh, uh, you know, leading the Asian Renaissance. Uh, absolutely. We, we talk about uh, the Sunday the Second World War is The war has tremendously changed, and uh, you know we are still in that temporary transformation. But unfortunately, we are seeing that there's a, there's a lot of uh, crisis going on, and it's very risky now. We are, we are living in a very dangerous world. But I would say, you know, in the, after the Second World War, when Britain won systems, when the when World Bank, the, you know, the IMF, WTO, and all those things. Globalization was really a very strong uh, momentum, and really we had a, a, you know West Western Europe, we had the, the, you know, the, the, all the, the North American countries. Well. But that I think the one of the most spectacular story was the rise of Asia. You know, we see that uh, we, had, we had four tigers uh, after you know, uh, the war had to finish here in, in Vietnam. I mean, we see four tigers rising up uh, in the sixties of the doing war, but also Particularly, we have Japan, South Korea, Vietnam. But I think probably one of the most impressive ones was the rise of China. And then, you know, China for only four decades, for you know, something like 45 years, uh, from a very low base, and now suddenly become second largest economy. And of course, we have this uh, uh, now uh, ASEAN success story, 50, 56 years of ASEAN success. So I think the, 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 we'll, we'll continue that uh, momentum, but of course we're having a lot of uh, uh, difficulties now. Uh, the world is seeing more and more capitalized, you know, the block lines, you know, divided into different blocks and, and, and systems. But what I actually I can see is actually the, the economic globalization that China and, 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 and ASEAN and Vietnam are leading a stupid to prevail because uh, that's where all the bread and butter is. That's where the prosperity is. That's where all the, uh, you know, the, the, the people's expectation is. We don't want to live in a very backward, uh, primitive society. The biggest the risk to de risk is that we're not having development. We're not having investment. We're not having trade. I mean, that's the biggest risk. We need to decouple the risk. We should not really de risk the couple from each other. We should really become more and more, uh, you know, Supported and united and important that we cannot be free. So that's why I'm saying that even though there, there's a there's a system, there's a forces that wants to really uh, divide the world into different geopolitical circles. Uh, we see, uh, of course, we see already uh, there's, a, there's a crisis going on, there's a war going on in Europe. We see now war going on in, in the Middle East. I mean, Asia is now happy about any war actually happened, but it's very very now. Also very dangerous. We want to keep the peace. We want to keep the status quo. We want to keep the growth. So, so I think it was important that the, the, the Asian countries should really work together. I mean, now we have the ASEAN, the largest free trade agreement in the world. Now we should really stick to that. We have CPTPP. We have that. Is a part of that. And China wants to be part of that. And I saw so China, Japan, South Korea is resuming their high level dialogues. And China also have a high level dialogue with, uh, with ASEAN. So, so, so let's really push for the economic globalization. Let's, let's do the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, Belt and Road, you know, and then uh, RCEP, CPTPP, NIPA, and all those, uh, you know, regional agreements. Let's uh, get on the free trade agreement. So I think if we stick to that direction, we 
can cut off the chip, we can go danger. We can cut off the, uh, what you call, you know, there might be other chip, we can force it. I think, in the end, we can sustain this period of time. But in 10, 15 years, like as I, as I was talking to Joseph Dyer, recently I found his book, he, he said, you know, by 2035, that, uh, you know, we could reach a new equilibrium. We have to live with each other. We have to really coexist peacefully. We cannot really, uh, you know, Without each other, we have to really be for the global peace of our life. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Henry makes two points which interest me. The first is the need for cooperation, because we're taught so often that competition is the most important factor. Increasingly, it's, it's not, and we need to balance where we're competitive and where we need to be cooperative. I think that's very important. The second point I'll pick up on is in terms of the title of this session, the, the term Renaissance is very interesting. If you look at the European Renaissance, which is often cited as a model of Renaissance thinking, it was actually a very small group of people, basically funded by the Medici family, and, and those, those people were in the main artists and philosophers, uh, and of course the Medici who were in business. That's very, very interesting, because again, it goes to the mark of the uh, quote, a small group of committed people can change the world. Now, what's happening south of China in Hong Kong is fascinating, especially in terms of wealth, family businesses, and the diaspora of wealth leaving China. What do we make of this, Roger?
reason for what he was not working in the southeast uh, Pacific. He actually went to colder climates in the world, and everywhere he looked, he found examples of cooperation within and between species. So, you know, the brainwashing of mind persists in terms of competition, competition. I was noticing in one of the sessions, for example, I was hearing a yeah, was really fascinating with how we uh, get to hear the voices of uh, women and young women in particular. And even the competition there is part of the ingrained thinking of we believe we don't have to fight to get out of that predicament. I want to shift to Vietnam and I want to hear from Lynn about what is happening in Vietnam that's so important because it's one of the most thriving economies, if not the most thriving economy. In Southeast Asia. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think you already uh, mentioned about uh, what's happening in Japan, uh, what's happening in China, but we can see that there's a big reading flow of Vietnam in the global arena. Uh, what we are here today is not talking about the uh, Asian relation, uh, what an example of Vietnam. Got the 
study and the proper corporate study to the university the curriculum that a lot of a lot of uh, change and a lot of initiative have been conducted in uh, in order to contribute to a better world now that in Vietnam. That is what we are happy for. I'm going to continue being naughty and provocative because uh, what Vin has just mentioned just breaks with me in terms of what you're talking about, the word competition, the balance between competition and collaboration. And this word growth, and everyone needs to grow, which is impossible on a finite planet. Infinite growth is needed in, in most of Southeast Asia, in fact. But while the developed world, the so-called developed world, continues to want to grow as well, we, we should begin to wonder how long that could last. The other thing that comes out of that, of course, is a huge question mark of what we actually measure in terms of growth. And it's, it seems to me that very often what happens now is that we value what we measure instead of measuring what we value. How do we deal that educationally then? How do we change people's mindsets about those kinds of terms? Well, I think that we have a, a broader issue in the education world, um, which has been perpetuating for decades, really for about 60 years now. We have seen a higher education system, secondary education system, follow that has reduced standards throughout the world. If you look at the amount of time that students spend on studies today, it is less than two-thirds of what they spent 50 years ago. Yet if you look at the grades that students receive, they've never been higher. They've been higher by an order of five to six x, not five to six percent, five to six times more A's or equivalents are granted today than they were in the 1960s for a fraction of the work. To compound if you actually look at the curricula of universities all over the world, from the west to the east, north, south, it's overwhelmingly irrelevant. If you ask almost any audience in any uh, setting, what is it that you studied in class that you were applying today, this week, this month, to your job, the overwhelming response is nothing. So not only are we lowering standards, not only are we rewarding certifications or awarding certifications for what is not actually learned, but even if we were to have learned it, we don't know how to use it. And places that are emerging have been obsessed with importing those models into new developing economies and political funds. Now, up until now, we have had a barely functioning relationship between academia and industry, with this broad assumption that universities broadly know how to select smarter students depending on their stature, and even if they don't do anything, then at least it gives employers a sense of which students are uh, were smart coming in and that they can therefore select them. Again, this is true all over the world. Today, even that is under threat. Not only because what universities teach have narrowed minds, they actually are starting to do damage to students, but more importantly, because of the AI world, the fundamental difference between AI and predecessor technologies is that AI is the first technology that can autonomously create. Every other technology that we have seen as humanity, from use of stone tools and fire all the way to the internet, has either leveraged our physical strength or 
reduced our need to compute or disseminate information. It didn't create something on our behalf. Today we have a technology that even at its current stage, extraordinarily primitive, despite how advanced <coughs> it's going to be dramatically more advanced in the future, is able to generate work that we think of as high order human contribution. And if the education system doesn't reckon with that immediately, not five years from now, not 10 years from now, you are going to see a rebalancing of economic outflows of the world. And it won't accrue to particular nations. It will accrue to particular individuals. And you don't know where those individuals are going to be. And so the opportunity for a country is to leapfrog, is to reimagine yeah. what an educational system can look like, not in the traditional way, but fit for purpose, fit for humans to be able to leverage AI for the benefit of their society. And right now, there isn't a government on the planet that is thinking about implementing a solution like that. The first few governments that will, will accrue enormous benefit in the future. And of course, the, I don't know what, what your thinking is, but certainly one of the governments who have seen, as you all can see, uh, the speed of technology change in the past few years is phenomenal. It's changing much faster. And one of that is generative AI, which we're talking about, and chat speed is just one of them. There are many other applications uh, of AI into our life in the industry, uh, to the enterprise. And uh, one of the things that we've been discussing is that you know, should AI replace the human being in some of the area? And you know, coding is one of that. And some programmers you know, feel worried that, okay, um, AI can replace the developer. One example. So my take is that there are some areas, certainly AI can play a very important role, but humans do that. Uh, there are some areas that uh, AI can replace or uh, significantly uh, take on the majority of the work. Uh, one example I can give is that I have a company that uh, we do investing into uh, using AI to process uh, document. Before the AI, it would take 10 minutes for a human being to just handle one document. Now we use AI and it reduces the time to only one minute. So 10 times faster and much more accurate than before. So that's another example AI can, can help. But throughout that process, the last step of the whole process is for human beings. So humans be there. You, know, you need to be there like a, a gateway to make sure that things are going the way that you want. Um, so that's, that's why I think that you know, AI will help to develop, but humans be there. The second thing I'd like to mention is that with AI and new technology, IoT, it also creates opportunities for Vietnam in particular, but also other countries, especially in Southeast Asia, where we have over 660 million people, really young. Vietnam, for example, we have over well, 100 million people, but over 60% of the population is under 30 years. So it's really it takes up the level, the adoption of technology is much faster than the other part of the world. So um, that's be the opportunities for, for the countries, for the Southeast Asia area, to use technology so that uh, they can live from, like you mentioned. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity. This, uh, uh, it's uh, something that uh, those countries uh, should take on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, so I still come back then to what you just said in terms of AI or AGI becoming sentient and therefore autonomous of human beings. Is that a worry of yours? Is that a concern? Well, not a large language model. The, the thing that we, you know, the, the science fiction version of AI, which may be science at some point, is based on a different theory of artificial intelligence. The large language model is just as it sounds. It takes an enormous amount of language and it processes generates insight from that language, but it does not think. Right? A thinking, a general artificial intelligence is a different line of research that because of a rise in large language models has actually uh, potentially been set 
back a little bit because so much attention has been on LLMs. But that doesn't mean that LLMs cannot produce their own work. I'll give you an example I've been giving a, a quite a bit over the last few months. In September, a company launched, uh, a client company launched in Silicon Valley called Omniscient. And Omniscient's, Omniscient, sorry, and Omniscient's, it will give you an, uh, an AI prompt, will allow you to upload some documents if you'd like, and in eight minutes, it will generate a fully written fiction or non-fiction book. Eight minutes. Now think about how long it takes five months ago for an author to sit down and generate a book. Now that has enormous implications to what it means for the economic value of labor. We've already had disruptions in factory automation. We've already had disruptions in the entire field, of course, in computation. As well as but we've always been able to retreat to our higher cognitive function. What happens when that is fundamentally changed? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm haunted by 2001, the space odyssey, where the captain asks the computer how to open the hatch door, and the computer replies, I can't do that. Sorry, I can't do that. Worried about that. Uh, I use AI just recently. We sent her uh, an open letter from the, um, the Asian Foresight Institute to the leaders of the Arab world. The letter was concocted by humans, but the manifesto under it, okay, to Roger's point about the two state solution, for example, the AI was unhesitatingly saying a two state model is not going to work in that situation ever, which is which is fascinating. Can we give back to China particularly, and China, and Roger and Henry, I'd like to hear your views on how influential is China going to continue to be, and how can that happen? What, what are we likely to see in terms of that influence over the next 10 to 20 years? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Richard. I, I think this is an excellent question. That's the question I think have often asked when I travel here. Well, I think China's, uh, you know, the, the, the success in the last 45 years was a really miracle. I mean, for example, China has been able to lift 800 million people out of poverty, and that represents 70% uh, of the poverty reduction in the current time. Uh, and uh, the UN SDG 2030 agenda, the number one objective uh, fulfilled by China, uh, 10 years ahead of time. But what's more, I think that uh, China has really managed to develop a system now, really, now it's not only functional pretty effectively, but also uh, can be really a, a system that can benefit more. For example, China has launched its better row initiative. I mean, the world has developed for so long, there's a lack of big developed plans. We haven't seen a big plan since Marshall Plan, but China was able to, to fill that uh, a gap, you know, that provides some public goods. Of course, China still has a lot of problems, I mean, it has a lot of challenges, has a lot of adjustments to make. China's, you know, Belt and Road is not perfect either, but, uh, but the pure fact is China's doing it. It's really great. What I, what I can summarize that is that, you know, because China's doing this uh, Belt and Road, has really also been uh, connecting the ASEAN countries. You know, we had just recently, the October, opened the Bandung and the uh, Jakarta, 350, you know, kilometers per hour. Cut down the four-hour travel to 40 minutes. Remarkable, you know, that, that can really, and then China is now, uh, has already had a, a really from China to Laos, and, and then planning something in Thailand, planning something in Malaysia. So you will see ASEAN will be super connected in, in, in the future to come. And China will be a group, big growth engine together with ASEAN. So Asia will still be the next biggest powerhouse in, in terms of economic growth in the world. And then what I've seen about China is that China is really now has really coming out of its own success, it really can benefit the global south. That's why we're seeing the, uh, the, the BRICS country double to 11 now. Because countries are tired of picking sides. They want to really pick on the economic uh, benefit, picking on the economic growth. 
So what chances success means? First, you build the infrastructure. I mean, there's a saying in Chinese, you want to be rich, build roads first. So that's what had happened, the connectivity with uh, Belton Rose, with, uh, with uh, you know, AIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and all those things. So that's really, uh, I think, the uh, uh, success that can be replicated everywhere in the world. And that's why we see the US is proposing Build Back Better World, b 3 And we see the EU is proposing EU Go Bold Day And we see even the G20 India was proposing Indian Middle East economic economy, uh, Europe economic corridor. So, so that infrastructure consensus has been really, since China started that, has recognized the world <laughs> recognition. Everybody's doing the same their thing. The point is that we have to really work together. Let's get a world back. You know, AIB, ADB, AFDB, and uh, you know, all those European banks together to do that. So that's, I think, the, the, the thing China can really uh, uh, you know, benefit more. But second is education. I mean, Vietnam is a, is a country that's been so young, so dynamic, so full of growth. But education was one of the other success China had. China has already 280 million college, you know, college education amounts to working population. Every year, China graduates about 12 million college graduates. That's enormous. So, so that that's another thing that China can, can really do. And thirdly, is to have a market economy. You know, China has developed a system that really has so effective. For example, China has the private sector, 60% of the whole, you know, all the companies, 60%, and then generates about uh, half of the GDP, 60% of the tax revenue, and 70% of innovation. And they have another 20% of multinational, generate 50% of China import export. And then you have another 20% SOE, that's all the, you know, uh, dirty works, uh, you know, build the fastest you know, train networks in China, uh, earthquake disasters, and uh, when, winter, when uh, Wuhan has a pandemic, the, the SOE hospital parachute, 40,000 medical staff to rescue the, the patient. So that kind of hybrid economy model, you don't see anywhere in the world. So I think that's really how China grows. I mean, China has its own logic and has its, you know, 5,000 years of civilization uninterrupted. China really con never colonized any place. You don't see anything like that. So, so what I see is that if China follows that economic model and, and ASEAN is really closely become the second, become the largest trade market of China. And, uh, and then of course, uh, China, also Asia, China, Japan. And South Korea also the largest trading partner. So you see Asia, which is the topic of our section, will be the leading, you know, global engine, and you know, contribute to two, two thirds of global economic growth. Will continue. So we'll land in the next 21st century. So I think that is probably something. The business opportunity are still here, right here, in Vietnam, in Asia, ASEAN, in China, and in, in, in the whole Asia part of the world. Thank you, Roger. Your perspective. From my perspective, I think uh, you know what Henry has said. Uh, of course, the, you know these are all true uh, statistics itself. But the Richard, the way you asked the question about influence, Chinese influence on a global basis, it sort of has a bad connotation attached to it. Like China is trying to rule the world. Influence, not necessarily ruling the world. You know, China is doing what it's doing best, and other people are copying or taking advantage of the development that's happening in China itself. Whether it's education, uh, you know, high-speed rail system, and so forth and so on. You, you know, so following what China is doing is beneficial to the entire world. It's not Chinese influence trying to politically control these countries. So this is the point I'd like to just emphasize a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll give a bit of a counterpoint, uh, because this is a very pro-China uh, uh, version of history. Um, I would argue that it is a little bit more balanced than that. Uh, the reality is, is that, of course, the miracle of Chinese development over the last 45 years has been stunning. Um, it was not just China that did it. It was Europe, the United States, the developed world, that provided an enormous transfer of wealth from the West to China. Um, and that was, uh, that was, and by the way, not just China, but the entire globalized world. And 
that was the great promise of globalization. It was a rising tide that lifted all boats, but it lifted some boats significantly more than others. Um, and, and we can't forget that. We can't forget that it was because of cooperation. It was because of an era that embraced globalization that this miracle of 800 million people in China lifted out of poverty occurred. Without globalization, that would not, never have occurred. It also is important to note that there is significant suspicion about Chinese influence in much of the world because many of the types of investments um, that have been made in the Belt and Road Initiative and others have come with strings attached, um, strings that the host governments did not like. Um, many of those projects were not, are not going forward or were seen back by some of those countries or uh, didn't benefit those countries as intended. And so you're not going to be perfect, obviously, in everything that you do, but it is more balanced. And so I, I think, what, why, why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because if we are going to be successful globally, we really should not just think regionally. And, 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 and if we have seen anything in the, in the last few years, is that there is nowhere to hide. COVID was not a regional problem, it was a global problem. When Russia invaded unilaterally Ukraine and did nothing to them except one man's insane ambitions to rule another country and kill people in the process. That set off a global inflation problem. We had nowhere to hide, right? When Hamas terrorists decided to break a ceasefire that's lasted for years and slaughter a bunch of innocent um, civilians, then the Israelis had to retaliate in Gaza and kill many more civilians. That created political and social reverberations around the world. It may actually lead to Donald Trump getting reelected. It's actually likely to do that. There is no place for us to hide. And so if we aren't thinking about global stability, if we aren't thinking about global prosperity, there won't be an Asian prosperity, right? We are where to try. Yeah, I happen to agree. Uh, I'm a futurist. Watch November next year. Donald Trump will get back. I'm on the record as having said that. Uh, what about, I'd, I'd like the panel's inputs in terms of actually what's happening now, which is a fragmentation of globalism to, to some extent. The rise of right-wing populism particularly. And, and from the point of view of a socialist nation like Vietnam, what does, what does that mean? What are you looking at when, when that kind of thing's going on in the rest of the world? Okay. Uh, it's a very good point that uh, we are living in a world where we have been, you know, have fought in here promoting globalization. And uh, in the few recent years, the term of de-globalization has become popular. Uh, and also, company in politics as well, and with the you know, and nationalism, the, all this thing is coming back. So the point, how can we balance? In uh, I think that in terms of uh, innovation, that uh, each country have to maintain and uh, maintain the push uh, uh, global and contribute to the global value chain in in some way. I think that is something that. Each economy has to be done. That is to avoid all that you know, conflicting trade, that globalization, the uh, deglobalization that become popular. In uh, Vietnam, is the same thing that we had been uh, suffer from the, the, the slowdown and the disruption in the global value chain. And, uh, and that is something that uh, not only Vietnam, but also I think that every economy has to think about. 2024 and in the near future, and especially when you know, like there's a shift in the uh, political arena in the U.S. For example, it, it, like as you mentioned, Donald Trump is coming back. Right? Every country has to face all that issue. That is something that we are challenging. Some challenging that we have to get over and overcome. Because 
one of the assumptions, of course, is we still continue to believe that the Westphalian model of state sovereignty still, uh, still pertains and still will continue into the future. And I wonder whether that's actually an illusion. Because if we're dealing with a thing like climate change, for example, or the pandemic, which is global, bearing in mind that nation states were, under the Westphalian model at least, were established to compete for resources and compete against each other, is the Westphalian model itself finished? Is national sovereignty a thing of the past? Roger, come on. Uh, well, I wouldn't say it's a thing of the past, but I think today, communication is such that, you know, we can gradually merge culturally, right? You know, you talk about Asian culture, Western culture, we are different, but we are getting closer and closer. But the important thing is to respect the other's culture as well. Not just say my culture, you have to follow my culture. So once we start respecting each other and recognizing their good points and their weaknesses, then we can move collectively forward. And there's so many issues that need to be done on a collective basis. One nation, the notion of what you say, nation, doesn't make sense. You know, you talk about uh, you know climate issues and so forth. How can one nation be involved in that? We are have, so we're really you know back to this globalization issue. But even on the globalization, we have to respect each other and recognize each other's culture. And I think the future generation will be picking the best of all cultures and come up, perhaps, even with a new culture. I think you're right. Hark back to what uh, Henry was saying, because obviously we need peace for, for everything you're talking about. Peace needs to prevail. Uh, the last time I was in Shanghai, I do a lot of work in China, the last time I was in Shanghai, I was talking to a group of business people, bureaucrats, and politicians. But a, a group down from Beijing as well. And the thing that interested me, I was being very critical of at, the, at that time, this is four years ago, uh, I was being very critical of the, uh, the US, and afterwards, I was approached by no fewer than five in the group, saying, Richard, you've got to be careful what you're saying. You're being far too harsh about our American friends, and not critical enough about the problems that China has. And I also understand that the Chinese actually know far more about America than America, the average Americans do about China. And I think that's, again, something that has uh, a, res there's a responsibility and an obligation there. We are nearing the end of this session. I just want to say one thing. Um, thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. I hope we were able to provoke you. I hope we were able to amuse you. I hope we were able to educate you. Uh, and keep you on the edge of your seats with some things, for example. I just want to leave one thought in your mind. That is, the past is in our minds, but the future, that's in our hands. Thank you very much.